gentlemen, you are listening to Life Well Lived by Amabila Stephen. It's an engaging and enlightening talk show on life, relationships, and the business of life. Grab a cup of juice and just chill. Life Well Lived by Amabila Stephen. Live life. Live fully. Hello, it's Amobola Steven and welcome to Live Live Amobola Steven. Now, if you want to catch up with some of our missed episodes, you can go online and search for Live Live Amobola Steven on any podcast distribution platforms. And there you go, have a work while listening experience as you do so. Perhaps you can also catch up with me on my social media handles on LinkedIn, Amobola Steven, on Facebook, Amobola Steven, perhaps on my blue buttons communications page on Facebook, you can like the page, or on my um, Instagram page, Mobila underscore S, and on my Twitter and Doom, or Mobila, Elisa. Now, on today's show, I have Paul Moore, Managing Director of three commercial real estate funds at Wellens Capital. He is the author of The Perfect Investment and also host to podcasts, including The Art of Investing and How to Lose Money. Now, Paul will be talking about spirituality, about revenue generation, business launch, and financing, and all that you need to know about investment. Welcome with me on Live Live by Stephen Paul Mo. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you. All right. It's a pleasure. So can you introduce yourself to my audience? Yeah. You know, I've been in business. I've been, uh, I, I graduated with an MBA in the 1980s and I went to Ford Motor Company. Then I have my own company and uh, we sold that to a public firm 23 years ago. And I've been a real estate investor and entrepreneur ever since. My problem all along has been, I've had this problem right here between my ears. And that is, I believed in this false dichotomy I believed in a, the, the lie that I had a spiritual life over here, and then I prayed and God answered prayers over here, but I have a business life over here, and that is separate from my spiritual life. And even if I knew that was wrong in my head, I still acted that way. And so I didn't know that God wanted to bring heaven to earth, God's principles, his ways, his rule and reign his kingdom in heaven to earth through my business. I found that out more recently, and I've been trying to act in regard to that in the last several years. And I have some great stories about what God's done in my business, but in other businesses as well. All right, great. So we'll be focusing more on spirituality and business. Now, let's go. Now, so what's the transition like from your stint at Ford um, Motor Company to becoming the MD of three commercial real estate funds? Yeah, so when I worked at Ford, I really liked I really liked Ford in Detroit, and I enjoyed my time there, but I always was on the side trying to start some side business. I always had something in mind I wanted to do, and so... As a result of that, I started tinkering around on evenings and weekends. And I finally, uh, my friend had started a wonderful company. And so I opened up an office with him and we were off to the races. Now, after doing that for years, we sold that company and I started, uh, I made the mistake of getting involved in everything that caught my eye. If it was a shiny object, I chased it. And so I got involved in investing And then when I got involved in investing, I wasn't really investing. I thought I was. It was actually speculating. Investing, Immobila, is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Speculating is when your principal is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. And I confused investing and speculating, and it caused a lot of trouble in my life. Uh, But anyway, I speculated a lot. I invested a little. I made a lot of money. I lost more money. And I learned a hard lesson, a lot of hard lessons along the way. But after 21, well, after about 15 years in real estate investing, uh, I got involved in starting Wellings Capital. And we created some funds. And now we allow commercial, excuse me, real estate investors who want to get involved in big commercial assets to invest with us. And we spread the money. We diversified across a lot of different commercial real estate projects. Oh, right, right. Now, what are some of the secrets that is employed by the super wealthy to attain and maintain their wealth over generations? Do you have any? 
Yeah. So a lot of super wealthy people invest in commercial real estate. In fact, almost all of them do. Residential real estate, like houses in the neighborhood, they typically, you know, they are valued based on comparable properties. They call them comps. And that means that the property is only as good as the neighborhood. But in commercial real estate, the value is based on math. And the math formula for commercial real estate is that the value equals the income divided by the rate of return. And so if the net operating income can be raised by certain things you do, and if the rate of return, sometimes the rate of returns can be shrunk, that means you can force appreciation. You can drive increased value. And that's our goal in commercial real estate. That's one of the reasons we love it. The other thing is the tax savings are amazing. There are fantastic tax savings and the, uh, the tax uh, opportunities, saving opportunities actually allow us to save money on the current deal, but then the next deal and the next deal and the next deal. And you can actually defer taxes in real estate through a ser series of transactions all the way until you die. And then you can leave your wealth with no capital gains tax on it to the next generation. It's quite fantastic. As long as the new administration doesn't tinker with the tax law, at least. Hmm. Great. So now can we talk about your wishes to rags uh, and the backstory? Interesting. Yeah, this is one of my spiritual stories in business. So in uh, 1997, I had uh, over a million and a half dollars in the bank. And um, 10 years later, exactly in the fall of 2007, I had two and a half million dollars in debt. And I actually had all that debt against uh, residential and commercial real estate deals, including a five acre piece of land that could be split into five one acre lots at a beautiful lake. And I didn't know how to split that. And my partner, we were going down, remember, into the Great Recession of 2008, but we didn't know that. We didn't know what was coming. We were hoping that the worst of this disaster was over, but instead we were facing the worst. The worst was yet to come. And so we, um, my business partner said, I can no longer pay half the interest on this debt. So he assigned it all to me. He gave me uh, his share of the ownership his share of the debt. And so we were, it was December, 2007. We had this huge amount of debt, two and a half million dollars. And I asked myself the question, what would George Mueller do? Now, George Mueller was one of my heroes. George Mueller was a hellion in Germany in the early 1800s, but he became a saint by, after he moved to England, he started being a pastor and he started caring for hundreds of people. And he said, what can I do to prove that God answers prayers, that proves he's a miracle working God? And so he started adopting orphans, not adopting, he started caring for orphans and he created an orphanage. And over the years, he eventually grew that orphanage to where they uh, eventually cared for, I believe it was up to 10,000 children total over the rest of his life. And he did it all by prayer and faith. He never ever asked anybody, even his own staff didn't know if they had any needs. And so he would pray and they would get all the money they needed exactly when they needed it. And so we were amazed about that. And uh, so I said, what would George Mueller do? Well, George Mueller would actually never have been in debt. So I was already in trouble, but that's beside the point. I said, George Mueller would do something outrageous, like George might pray his way out of debt, or he might give his way out of debt. So I gathered my family around, six people, and I said, family, we're in big trouble. We're going to start giving our way out of debt. <laughs> and then I told my friends who said, you need to declare bankruptcy. And I said, no, I'm going to give my way out of debt. And so we started giving. And we started giving a set amount, which was quite a painful amount. January 1st, 2008, we gave a certain amount every week. And we stayed with that plan. We said, we'll stay with this until bankruptcy or until we're rescued. Hmm. And a month later, 
God gave me an idea, a really, really unique idea to split that five acres up. And uh, it was really, it seemed like it was against the law. So I went straight to the authorities of the county and I said, here's my plan. What do you think? And they couldn't believe it. They said no one in decades had ever come up with a plan like that. And they said, where did you get this idea? And of course, I got it from God. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, I said, my friend helped me and I had I was praying and all this. Anyway, so 13 months later, there was a whole lot of work ahead. There was a lot of trials. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of fear. But I kept we kept giving as a family. And 13 months later, we were completely debt free. Oh, we even God. paid off our house. Wow, marvelous. Steve, now I've been having a brilliant discussion with Paul Moore, who is the managing director of three commercial real estate funds as well in Capital. He's a podcast host and also he is an author. Now, Paul, the question to you is that your podcast is titled How to Lose Money. Now, who wants that? Can we talk? Yeah. Um, you know, about, uh, about 20 years ago, I started going to different conferences, you know, as an entrepreneur. And I noticed that at all the conferences, the people were telling all their success stories, and everybody was amazed at their wonderful success. And I thought to myself, these people are also discouraged, because they're so far from that success, they don't think they could ever get there. And they would stay in the, you know, in the lobby and on the breaks. Oh, I'll never get there. That guy had all the breaks. He had all the connections. He had all this or she had all that. We'll never make it. And I thought, how sad that they don't tell about their struggles. And they wouldn't talk about their struggles. This one conference I went to seven years in a row, people even asked them during the Q&A time, what are you struggling with? And they wouldn't say anything. I don't know why. And so I thought, if I ever get to that place where I'm on a stage, I'm going to talk about my pain and losses and struggles along the way. Well, I did get there. And I got to know these people, and I realized they had the same pain, losses, struggles that I did, but they made it. They persevered. And so when we started a podcast four years ago, we decided to call it How to Lose Money. And we interview people about their pain and losses and struggles on the way to the top. And we've interviewed 230 some people. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful time to learn about their pain. Oh, great. Now, do you have any strategies you can recommend for people to earn more allies? So um, I think that it's really important to know the difference between investing and speculating, which I mentioned before. And if you want to speculate, that's fine, but you need to realize you're doing it. And you need to realize that the Warren Buffett way to wealth is quite different. He believes in a snowball effect where you invest carefully, you analyze carefully, you invest in cash flowing companies that produce an income, and you continue to slowly build your wealth that way. And if you study Warren Buffett's strategies, if you study uh, Benjamin Graham, who lived about a hundred years, he was famous. He started becoming famous about 90 years ago. Um, you'll realize this thing called value investing. And basically they're trying to find opportunities that are below that where the market is much, uh, behind on the income. In other words, the income it's producing is much higher than the market value. And by doing that, uh, they have found a wonderful way, a wonderful path to building wealth. All right, great. Now, um, can you give us an example of um, cash flowing companies? Yeah, so, I mean, Warren Buffett in 1997, 8, 9, 2000, people thought he was foolish because he didn't invest in the internet. He didn't invest in internet stocks. But the problem with internet stocks is they did not typically have a profit. They were just based on this wild uh, desire uh, for profit and this uh, possibility of growth. And of course, Amazon came out of that. And Amazon became one of the largest companies in the world. But for Amazon, if you could have picked Amazon and invested in that in 1998 or nine. 
uh, you would have been unique because there were thousands of other companies, including one that was from a, my, my close friend that failed. Thousands of companies failed while Amazon succeeded. And a few others succeeded, but a whole lot failed. And it was very hard to pick that. And Warren Buffett decided he would completely avoid all the internet stocks. He, invo he said, you know, I don't like to invest in the internet because I don't know where the internet will be in 10 or 20 years. I'd rather invest in Wrigley's chewing gum because the internet will never change the way people chew gum. And wow. uh, so Warren Buffett invested in things like that. He invested in, um, he invested in uh, mobile homes. He bought uh, Clayton Homes, the largest manufacturer of mobile homes in America, first or second largest. He bought uh, insurance companies and banks and airlines, companies that were boring, but they did really well. And I'll tell you that commercial real estate, a lot of it's boring. Recession resistant commercial real estate, we've investigated this and we found that mobile home parks and self storage are much better than others in uh, resisting the ups and downs of the market. And that's where we invest. And we love those two asset types. Oh, great. <laughs> now let's talk about stream. Spirituality. <laughs> so how can God use people to do miracle in the business sector? Do you have any experience to share? Yeah, like I said, I have this false dichotomy in my head. But as Christians, we can we have the opportunity to bring heaven to earth. And I have lots of stories about that. But um, here's a quick one. Uh, there was a guy named Matt McPherson. He lived in Oshkosh, Wisconsin area. And he was, he believed that God wanted to do great things to, through him, but he also loved bow hunting. And so the problem with compound bows, you know, the kind of bows that people use for hunting, they had been invented in the late 1960s, but they never worked perfectly. They were out of sync. And uh, the top and the bottom never fired perfectly because they had two cams on them. And so one day God whispered to him and gave him this thought. He said, I have the best ideas in the world for everything. If people would just ask me, well, he said, okay, if you've got the best ideas in the world for everything, can you show me how to build a better compound bow? And about two weeks later, he was sleeping. And in the middle of the night, he woke up and there was a piece of paper floating in front of his face, suspended in midair. And it even had the three holes on it. And there was a pencil drawing on it of a completely different kind of compound bow. And so he woke up and he began to copy this down and he began to begin to draw it. And his wife said, what are you doing? And he said, I think I'm having a vision. Well, Whoa. anyway, he went and he built that compound bow and he got a patent on it. And now he has over 20 patents. And, wow. you know, I'll, I'll tell you, a mobile lot, the uh, Kia uh, and Honda built a lot of cars and they make a small profit on each car. Rolls Royce builds only a few cars a year, very small number, and they have a huge profit on each car. Well, Matthews Bow Company, Matthews Bows, builds the most bows, and they have the highest profit margin on each bow. And he's become the largest archery equipment manufacturer in the world. And he did it all because he believed God and God answered his prayer. Hmm, great. Now, that's very deep. Wow, very deep. Now, um, is invested really in heart? Well, I, you know, I think investing is both a science and an art. Hmm. Some of the greatest investors in the world, they analyze it quite scientifically, but there's also an art to it. There's also like when, when, when stocks or when something is dropping very, very quickly, it's very hard to have the courage to invest in it, even if you know if the numbers say you should. And so the numbers is the science part. And then the, the knowledge and the courage and the conviction to invest in something that looks really bad and everybody's trying to get rid of, the courage to buy it right then is very difficult to muster up. And that's where the art comes in. 
Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul Moore. Now, I'm rounding up with this question. I know that you are the author of The Perfect Investment. Now, do you have any business or investment lessons you want, my, you want to share with my audience? Yeah, so The Perfect Investment is the thesis that multifamily, that's apartment investing, is the perfect investment. It has great demographics, uh, baby boomers, are renting more and more and they never go back to owning when they do. Uh, millennials are renting more than they own. Uh, Gen Z looks like they'll be a generation of renters and also immigrants rent more often than they buy and they rent for longer. And so because of these four factors, we believe that rental apartments is the perfect investment. Now, the problem is too many people have gotten into this and too many people are chasing these deals and they've driven the prices up to ridiculous levels. And so my lesson for investors is, though my book's called The Perfect Investment, I would say The Perfect Investment is not perfect if you can't find a good price on a deal. And so don't believe The Perfect Investment. Even if an author tells you that, wait till the price comes back to normal. Nice one. <laughs> I like that. That's Thank the first you. time I've ever said that sentence. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it means something. <laughs> yeah, you heard it here first. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been lovely, but more than saving. Now, I really have a worldwide discussion with Paul Ma. Now, let's do this some other time. Till I come your way, I need you to always stay safe for now for me to you. Ciao. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Life Well Lived by Amabala Stephen. It's an engaging and enlightening talk show on life, relationships, and the business of life. Grab a cup of juice and just chill. Life Well Lived by Amabala Stephen. Live life. Live fully. I made an old man. story He took out an open And wrote something for me Then he kept walking on down 